Great. Thank you very much, Brock. They're a very excellent introduction. The one thing you all should have heard in that introduction is that I am, by training and education, although I assure you not by temperament, a lawyer. A lawyer who's going to help you build a successful business. Kill me now. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been practicing for 35 years of my life. 25 of those years, I have done nothing but work with entrepreneurs and people like yourself starting small businesses, everything from one-person consulting firms to some companies that are today on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing uh, privately owned companies in America. Um, I, I, as I said, I've worked with about 15,000 people just like who have dreams just like you have. Um, so I think I have a little bit to say about this and also too, I am a solo consulting practice. I am a lawyer but a lawyer is a consultant. That's basically what I do. You come to me for consulting advice in the field of legal compliance, and that's basically what you do. So for the past 25 years, I have been operating a solo consulting practice. Um, I work out of my home. Most of the time, I am naked. Uh, well, or in my bunny slippers or my bathrobe. You know, I work out of my home. By the way, a little lesson about technology. I really am not qualified to talk about technology, but whenever you set up a webcam on your computer, you know, you have to go through the various settings and stuff. Whatever you do, do not select the one that says, turn webcam on when a call comes in. Okay, do not select that one. Okay, because that can have very bad repercussions if you work naked. Uh, I, just, just trust me, I found out. Okay, don't ask me how. Um, one other thing I want to get out of the way before we begin our program tonight, some of you were thinking about this, and I, you know, I, I always like to be very open and honest about how I do business with people, you know, and I, and I know, I mean, look, let's face it, we're, we, we, SCORE is always about being very real about things, but let's just be very honest. The last time any of you saw anything this big and this purple, it was Barney. Okay, let's be very honest about that. Everybody, I love you, you love me. From, from a lawyer, right? That's coming really great. Um, tonight's topic is all about going being a solo basically a solo consulting practice or any other kind of personal service business where the the product the service is you not something uh, basically we're all going to be talking about uh, we will be doing some legal and tax stuff but not a whole lot it's mostly about things that I have learned in 25 years of doing this on my own and working with thousands of other people who have it's it's a very practical program okay if you ever doubted that I was a lawyer now you know for sure uh, first we tell you what we're not going to do and then we tell you what we're going to do. A uh, couple of disclaimers here. First of all, I am not an employee of SCORE or anything like that. I am totally independent. Uh, so if you, if you listen to something I say and you think it's a good idea and you listen to it and you take it to heart and you go home and it absolutely doesn't work for you and you end up losing your business and going bankrupt and your spouse leaves you and your dog pees on your leg and you end up living in a diaper box under the Sikorsky Bridge, you cannot sue SCORE. In fact, since I'm a lawyer, you really can't sue me either. So you're kind of SOL, okay, in that situation, seriously. The second disclaimer, though, is the more important. We are going to talk about some legal and tax things here, but please, none of this that I'm going to be saying tonight is one-on-one -on -one advice. For that, you have to hire an attorney who is admitted to practice in this state, which I am, uh, and pay him a little bit of money uh, to sit down with you. I mean, right now, I don't know any of you well enough to be able to give you one-on-one -on -one advice as to what you should do. So while the information I am presenting is relevant and accurate, do not take it as something that you should be doing. Uh, it's just, this is just a general program to give you an idea, frankly, what are the right questions you want to ask your lawyer, your accountant, and the other people you're going to work with while you're building a solo, consul a solo consulting practice. Okay, so here's our overview. These are the things I'm going to be talking about tonight. Basic decisions to make before starting your business, how to market your consulting practice, how to negotiate your consulting contracts, business issues for running, growing, and selling your consulting practice, and then we'll wrap it up and I'll tell you some funny stuff. Okay, should you consider consulting? Just, just by a show of hands here, how many people here are kind of in transition right now? You've come out of corporate America, okay, quite a few people here. Uh, that's, that's a very common situation. Uh, how many people here have a consulting business that they've been doing for a while and you're hoping I'll say something to make it better? Okay, quite a few of you people. How many people came for the donuts? Okay, that's it. Okay. Okay, and that's good. Uh, you know, and, and how many people here are Cliff Enico groupies? I do, I do have a couple, you know. I, I always tell people, you know, there's good news and there's bad news. I'm one of the few lawyers in the United States who actually has groupies. It's amazing. The bad news is they all look like you. That's the problem. I, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. They don't look like the ones in, what was that movie, Almost Famous? Uh, they don't look like that. Okay, 
Should you consider a consulting career? Let's face it, especially if you've worked in corporate America for a while. You're, you know, maybe you got a package, maybe you didn't. You're kind of in between. You're looking at the next phase of your life. You're looking at a number of things. But geez Louise, you have all these years of experience uh, behind you, and you want to make use of it. You don't want to take the last 20 years of your life and just throw it out the window. You've got to feel that somewhere out there, there's some, there's some people who still need this advice, uh, and you want to take advantage of that. So if you're between jobs or looking for some extra retirement income, a consultant Consulting uh, practice is absolutely something you should consider. Um, how many people here know what a portfolio career is? Okay, a couple of people. That's basically where you do a bunch of stuff, different kinds of things, but they all drive revenue to your bottom line. A very successful way, by the way, for older people uh, to grow into retirement. Um, so, for example, you might want to do a little consulting on the side. You may want to write a couple of books and get uh, royalties like I do. You may want to go around and do some paid speaking around the country at conferences. That's an example of a portfolio career. Uh, it's a very good idea because what you're doing there is you're hedging your bets. So if the economy goes down the toilet again like it did a few years ago, at least something will be driving revenue to your bottom line. Planning a career is very much like planning an investment portfolio. And that's a topic that I probably will do for SCORE another day. Maybe as a sideline business to do on evenings and weekends. I say maybe here because in my experience, consulting tends to be a 24-7 commitment. It's very hard to confine a consulting practice to evenings and weekends and part-time. It's very hard to do because if you get one client, clients tend not to want you for 5, 10 hours a week. They tend to want you for 50 hours a week and for five weeks. That tends to be the typical consulting gig. So it's very hard to confine. I, I don't really know too many consultants who are able to confine it, uh, their practices to evenings and weekends. If they're successful at all, they end up working 24-7, uh, which is a good problem to have, by the way. Uh, if it happens a lot, you can quit your day job, and that's what you're looking to do. Know if an agreement with your present or former employer prohibits you from doing so. This is very important, especially if you have come out of a big corporation. You may have signed an agreement at some point in your career that prohibits you from competing, quote unquote, with your former employer. And if you do sign, did sign an agreement like that, have an attorney look at it before you do anything. Uh, because you may very well have signed a, out away your life. I have seen people who've come out of corporate America uh, who have signed a, such a broad agreement that they basically can't do any consulting uh, on the side uh, if it's at all related to the work that they were doing for their former employer. Uh, Non-competes are not boilerplate. Everyone is very specific. Uh, have an attorney look at it before you do anything if you have any questions at all about what you can and cannot do. Okay. Should you work out of your home? Well, I have another whole program, by the way, which you, which you should be aware of. Uh, it's called From Cubicle to Home Office. Uh, it's on my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube.com and type in Cliff Enico in the search box, and you'll find it. I have a whole 60-minute program on uh, working out of your home. Uh, but here are the basics. Most consulting businesses can be run from a home office. In fact, I will humbly suggest to you that as a consultant, it's very hard to make money unless you cut your overhead expenses to the absolute bone. Uh, you know, overhead is what kills you uh, when, you're, when you're working for yourself. So a home office is absolutely made for a consulting business. You will not get into trouble with the zoning authorities because you're quiet, you're working on your computer most of the time, or maybe you're on your phone. Uh, the only time you might get a little, into a little trouble is if you see clients in the home. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, if you plan to see clients in your home office, however, I would strongly suggest you consider renting uh, a small office. Are you familiar with these executive office suites? They exist everywhere. They're certainly here in Connecticut, and they're in virtually all parts of the country, where you can rent an office month by month. You don't have to commit to a long-term lease, and it's got all the furnishings, the bookcases, and all that stuff. You just supply the computer and uh, hook up the phone line. They even have like an, an admin person who works for all the people in the building and answers your phone and does like that, and you just pay by the month. That's the ideal solution for a solo consulting practice. If you are seeing clients in the home, it's very awkward to work out of a home office because, number one, um, you're, first of all, your spouse is not going to like this. They're not going to like the idea of clients traping through the house. Uh, you might find after the first couple of clients uh, visit your home that certain items, uh, family heirlooms, antiques, and things have gone missing. Not every client is a good person. Um, okay, uh, they mess up the house. Your spouse is going to have a problem with that. Also, too, uh, if people, if the local kids can't play basketball on the street because they're too busy dodging, you know, all the cars, and if there are people sitting on your lawn, you know, waiting to see you, and there's ten cars in the driveway, the zoning people might reach out and ask for a visit. 
uh, because you're changing the character of the neighborhood. That's what they don't like. As long as you're quiet, they'll let you run your business out of your home office. But if they see you, if you're so, if your business is so visible that it's changing the character of the neighborhood, that's when you're going to hear from the local zoning cops, and it will not be a pleasant conversation. Okay, let's talk about getting started. Here are the seven things you need to get started. Actually, you need a lot more, but these are the basics. Business cards and stationery, duh. Even in this digital world, I think you still need some, uh, some dead trees there. A limited liability company, LLC. LLCs were made for solo consulting businesses. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, do I even need an LLC? Can I just be a sole proprietor? Well, the answer is you can be if you want to, uh, depending on the type of consulting you do. Uh, if you're doing anything at all that might get you sued, however, so let's say, for example, you're an IT consultant, and let's say you go to work for a big company, and you totally bite the pooch, you do something wrong, and their entire system goes down for three days, they lose millions of dollars. Uh, guess who's on the hook for that? Uh, if it was your fault, if it was something you did wrong, uh, I would suggest you forming an LLC is a very good idea to try to limit your liability. Also, too, a lot of clients, especially large corporations, will insist that you have an LLC because they think it protects them from liability. And I'll, 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 I'll have another slide coming up in a minute on that. You need some contract forms, and that's kind of where I come in as a lawyer. Uh, I will help you do a suite of contracts. I'll tell you in a minute exactly what you need there. A book, an ebook, or downloadable articles, you need some content. You want to show people that you're not just a consultant, but you're an expert. You need to do things to build your credibility. Uh, I have written 15 books. Now, just hearing that piece of information, you know, what, what, what are you thinking? Boy, 15 books? I can't even imagine writing one. This guy's written 15. Boy, he must be really good. Well, they could all be junk, too. I mean, you know, how do you know the books are any good? You don't, but there's the fact that I've written 15 books. You're not going to question my credibility. You're not going to look at my diploma on the wall too closely, are you, when you got 15 books out there? You know, I mean, I use books as marketing tools. When I walk into a new client for a first time, I always give him, whether he asks for it or not, an autographed copy of one of my books. It's an incredible icebreaker, and any conversation about those wild toga parties in my college days, you know, that are up on Facebook, nobody even thinks about that stuff anymore. So seriously, you want to do things that build credibility. Uh, these days, you can do an ebook for less than $200. By the way, if you do it right, this is not an expensive proposition like it used to be. Um, I seriously suggest, suggest that you do it. You need a website and you need a LinkedIn profile. Facebook, Twitter, eh, I'm not so sure. Depending on what you're doing, Facebook and Twitter tend to be B B2C, business to consumer uh, social media sites. The B2B social media site is LinkedIn. And that's the one where you want to be. That's where your LinkedIn profile, I think, is more important because that's where your corporate clients are going to be looking for you. They're not going to be looking for you on Facebook. They don't want to hear about your wild, your wild parties and driving your ATV through the Mojave Desert. They don't care about that. What they care about is do you look professional? And LinkedIn is where you're going to be. They expect you to have it. You will need some insurance. There are two kinds of insurance you need. You need some kind of basic liability policy, especially if you are seeing clients in the home. This is slip and fall insurance. This protects you against stuff like that. Many of your clients will ask that you have this so that if you do go into their corporate ha headquarters and you slip down a flight of stairs and you hurt yourself, it will not be their insurance that pays for it. They want you to have your own. So you are going to need that. And then you also need errors and omissions, E&O insurance. This is malpractice insurance. This is if you're the IT consultant who uh, causes a virus to get on the client's system and wipes out their entire database. This is the insurance that would protect you against that. You do not need workers' compensation insurance in Connecticut or New York if you are the only person in your business. If you are a solo, if you do not have W-2 employees, you do not need workers' comp insurance. Some clients may want you to get that, and they are absolutely wrong about that. Uh, if, if, a, if a client wants you to have workers' comp, if it's in their contract, make sure you strike that from the contract. You do not need the owner of a business is not considered an employee for W-2 and tax purposes. Okay. Then last but not least, a client, and preferably two or more. Okay. Let's talk about employee versus independent <coughs> contractor. This is obviously the big legal thing that you have to worry about. Um, the whole reason why somebody is hiring you as a 1099 is because they don't want to hire you as an employee. Why not? Because if they hire you as an employee, well, then they got to pay all the dreaded employment taxes, FICA, FUDA, Medicare, all that stuff. Uh, Medicare going higher now because of Obamacare. Uh, they don't want to have to pay that. You have to, when you're a 1099, you get to pay all that stuff. All they do is write you one check and you deal with all the taxes. There's no withholding. Um, they also want a relationship that's much more snap on, snap off. Employees have rights, whereas 1099s do not. 
Uh, and there's a whole bunch of employment laws that apply to employees that do not apply at all to tend to independent contractors. So that's the thing. So they all want you to be an independent contractor. But, okay, who decides whether you're an employee or an independent contractor? Believe it or not, that is not your decision, and that is not your client's decision, okay? A lot of people think, oh, I signed an agreement, I said I was going to be an independent contractor. Well, guess what? It does not matter what your contract says. The IRS can rewrite that agreement. If they do an audit of your client, of your customer, and they see that what was really going on was an employment relationship, they have the power to disregard that clause in your contract. So even though you've been doing everything right, you've been withholding, you've been paying taxes, you've been doing all the right stuff, the IRS can come down and say, nope, you were really an employee. And the number of hours you work don't matter either. You can be an employee for two hours a week, believe it or not. That is absolutely possible. Uh, you know, there is such a thing as a part-time employee. You do not have to be full-time to be an employee. This is just common sense. Here's the key. You are an employee if the client can direct and control your activities. The IRS, some of you know, has 20 criteria that they use, that their auditors use when they audit uh, employees versus independent contractors. But let me really make it simple for you. It all boils down to this one concept. If your client can direct and control your activities you, while you're working for them, you are an employee. You are not, not, not an independent contractor. So here's my little example. Think of this whenever you find yourself in a situation where there's a question about this. Let's say that, that you're working for me, okay? Um, you know, you're, you're doing some stuff. I have some kind of online business. If I have the power to do the following to you, you are an employee you are not an independent contractor. Hey, Cliff, listen, uh, stop what you're doing right now. We just got a big order from eBay. I want you to help me pack these boxes. I want to try to get this order out this afternoon to the UPS store before, uh, uh, before the last UPS pickup happens. Stop what you're doing. Help me pack these boxes. Help me load the truck. And then as soon as I get out of here to the UPS store, you can go back and do whatever it was you were doing. If I have the power to jerk you around like that from one job to another, you are an employee. You are not an independent contractor. Okay, take me for example, I'm a lawyer. If you hire me as your lawyer, there is no way anyone is gonna say that I'm your employee. So if you, so when you call me, first of all, I'm not in your office. I got a lot of other clients that I'm trying to serve and sometimes that's a real big challenge. But here's the real reason why I'm not your employee, because you cannot tell me to stop doing something for somebody else and work for you. Although believe me, a lot of clients try. I will tell you that a lot of clients do try to do that. So here's the thing. You can certainly give me a deadline. You can certainly say, hey, Cliff, I need you to look at this contract. I need it by Friday because I'm having a meeting with somebody. You can certainly do that. But between now and Friday, I get to decide which projects I work on at what times. That's what makes me an independent. The key to independent contractor is the word independent. I have to be able to set my own schedule, use my own materials, my own equipment. I'm the manager of my time if I'm an independent contractor. If I'm not, then I'm an employee. So here's some of the things to watch out for. Your client wants you to block out a specific time each week. Thursday afternoons from 12 to 4, I don't want you working for anybody else. That's an employment relationship. That is not independent contractor, if they can do that for you. Working at the client's offices, a set number. Don't get me wrong, you can certainly go to meetings at your client's office. That will not make you a, an, employee, an employee. But if you're required to be there at certain times or, or a certain number of hours per week, that's starting to look like an employment relationship to the IRS. Then last but not least, using the client's office space, equipment, and other resources. If, if you find your clients are inviting you to the company picnic, talk to your lawyer. That is not something that they do for independent contractors. If the relationship starts getting a little too cozy, it's time to talk to your lawyer and find out if you're really an independent contractor. Okay. Uh, here's another myth. Okay, I get, these, I, get, I get a call at least once a week from somebody who calls me up and says, Cliff, um, I'm not really so sure that I'm an independent contractor. I'm working for this company, they're my only client, and I'm working 50 hours a week. Uh, the client is a little worried that I might be considered an employee. Uh, are they right? Well, duh. Yeah, you're working 50 hours a week. That means, number one, you can't work for anybody else. The fact that you're working for just one client doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot. But the fact that you're working so hard for that client that as a practical matter, you can't work for anyone else. As an independent contractor, you must have the ability to work for multiple clients. And if one client has taken up so much of your time that as a practical matter, you can't work for other clients, that is a sign that you are really an employee and not an independent contractor. Even if the contract says 
that you are an independent contractor. Remember, the IRS can always rewrite those things. And forming a single member LLC will not by itself make you an independent contractor for tax purposes. A lot of clients want you to form an LLC because they think that somehow they've read somewhere that an LLC cannot be considered an employee for tax purposes. I don't know personally where they got that idea. Uh, I have never seen it. I think I've looked at the entire tax code in my career. Uh, I poke my nose in a lot of places and I have never seen that concept anywhere uh, in the tax code. Uh, if you, a single member LLC is what they call a disregarded entity for tax purposes and other purposes. So if you're a single, if you're a one person LLC, I don't think that that will protect them from your, if you're being considered an employee. But you know what? Don't tell them about it. This is their problem, not yours. You know, so if they want you to form an LLC, form an LLC. It's good for, there are a number of other good reasons to form an LLC, which we can talk about separately. It doesn't cost out that much. It only costs a couple of hundred dollars in most states to set up an LLC. And frankly, you should have one anyway. It makes you look more official. It makes you look more serious. You know, Cliff Enico, attorney at law, well, that sounds like a little guy, right? You know, Cliff's Legal Services LLC is starting to sound a lot bigger. And Legal Services LLC sounds a whole lot bigger, doesn't it? Sometimes you form an LLC for optical reasons, so you look a lot bigger than you really are. Okay, the biggest question I know a lot of you guys have, how do you price your services? My lesson here is don't give your client too good a deal. By far and away, the biggest mistake that all consultants make, and you make it, a, you make it at least once, is you're starting out, you're panicked, you're afraid you're not gonna get any business, and so you price yourself for 20 bucks an hour when your nearest competitor is charging $200 an hour. That is too good a deal for people, and, and it hurts yourself. It really does. My little rule of thumb here is you should find out what your competition charges. Don't be afraid. Call them. Pretend to be a client. I have done this. I have called other lawyers under an assumed name just to, find, to, and to say I need help forming a corporation or buying a franchise or all the other things that I do for folks. Just out of curiosity, what would your fees be for something like that? Just because I want to make sure, I want to find out what their fees are. Not everybody puts their fees up on their website like I do. Sometimes you gotta find out, you gotta do a little homework. Have your spouse do this. Uh, call them pretending to be a client. It's absolutely perfectly fair game. Uh, nothing illegal, immoral, or fattening about it. Uh, find out what they're doing, and then when you know what their competition is doing, give your clients a discount, but no more than 10 or 20%. No more. Any more than that, you're leaving too much money on the table. Okay, never underprice yourself. This is, I, this is one of my biggest lessons. First of all, people are not nice. If they know what, what, they're, what, you're, what they're doing, and if they know that you don't know what you're doing, they will take advantage of you. What they'll say to you is something like, well, gee, Mr. Renico, I, you know, I hear what you're saying, $50 an hour is what you want to charge me, but I gotta be very honest with you. I can get this kind of service anywhere in Fairfield County, Connecticut for $30 an hour. I'll do you a favor, just because you're new, you're starting out, you want to have a client that you want to talk about, uh, I'll let you do this for me for $40 an hour uh, as a favor this once. Meantime, your nearest competition is at $100 an hour, right? You are being taken advantage of here, and people will do that with you if they sense that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, if you underprice yourself, what's gonna happen is you're gonna end up working 90 hours a week for $30,000 a year, which I don't know about you, I don't think anybody can live in this part of the country on $30,000 a year. You're gonna end up, you're gonna end up exhausted, you're gonna be hating, up, hating your clients and your life when it's really your fault because you weren't courageous enough to stand up for what you're worth. I always believe overcharge a little bit. Don't be afraid to overcharge. If you, if you go too high, if you make a mistake and you go too high, that's an easy fix, because you can always discount. You can always say, well, gee, I'm usually $500 an hour, but I'll be very honest, I, you're, you're a nice company. I see a lot of long-term relationship here, a lot of uh, projects each year. Uh, this isn't just a one-off thing. Uh, for this first project, I'll do it for $400 an hour. Uh, but then, you know, if you like the first job that I do and you want me to do more for you, then we gotta go to my $500 standard rate. Meanwhile, what the client doesn't know is that all your competition's at $300 an hour. You're, now you're taking the tables and you're turning them. You're reversing them on the client. Always, when in doubt, always go high. Because if you overshoot, you can always discount. Whereas, and some of you guys know this, if you shoot too low, it's very hard to raise your prices. When I try to raise my hourly rate by $5 an hour, my clients squeal like stuck pigs. They do, they think I stabbed them with a knife. Well, what do you mean, $5 more per hour? What am I getting for that? Well, you're getting me, you know, inflation, you know, and stuff like that. No, man, I, I, I can't handle that. I just can't handle that. You, you're assuming me, you're, you're a Fortune 500 corporation. I think you can handle a $5 an hour increase in my face. Seriously, raising prices is very hard to justify. It's a very hard thing to do, and your clients will definitely object. 
Here are the three biggest mistakes consultants make by far. We talked about the first, underpricing themselves, especially at the beginning. Selling too soon. You know, when you're in a meeting trying to sell your, your consulting services, keep your mouth shut. S don't talk. Ask lots of questions. Find out what the client's needs are. Find out what their fears and passions are. I have a video uh, up on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, where I talk about how to sell. I talk about how it's not needs and wants, it's fears and passions. We're not gonna go into that here. But until you know what your client is specifically looking for, you shouldn't be talking about anything that's in your portfolio, your little bag of tricks. Uh, keep your mouth shut. The biggest mistake all salespeople make, not just consultants, is they start talking too soon about what's in their inventory when they really should be listening. During the first half of a sales meeting, you should be doing less than 20% of the total talking. The other person should be doing the vast bulk of it. Only when you know what they're looking for do you then open your mouth and say, oh, I can help you with that. I know how to do that project or I know someone who can. Great. The, le set, the third thing, staying inside the box and not taking on projects that require a learning curve or stretch. Do not become a prisoner of your resume or your marketing materials. Your marketing materials say you do A, B, C, D, and E, but there's a whole lot of other stuff you can do, you just haven't done it yet. Don't box yourself in. A lot of consultants make that mistake, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the marketing stuff. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of consultants box themselves in. Uh, to stuff. When people say that you're a facilities manager, that creates a very specific image in somebody's mind, and they're going down a checklist of, okay, I got five projects here, but none of them are things that a facilities manager would do, so I'm not going to hire this person. The, uh, and, uh, what they don't know is that three of those five things you could probably do. So when you, when you market yourself, be a little fuzzy. By all means, tell people who you are, but don't be so specific that you end up locking yourself out of other opportunities that can come up. If I have time at the end of the talk, I'll give you a very graphic example of how that works. Okay, so now you've got a consulting practice, you're set up, you've got the seven things you need. Now it's time to start marketing. Marketing is the key to success in any small business, especially in consulting. Consulting is a personal service business. People do not buy your services, they buy you. Why do I do all these talks? Well, I like talking, I like speaking, I'm kind of a ham. I was one of those college drama guys. I was best actor in my high school drama club three out of four years. The only reason I didn't make it my fourth year, they did a musical and I can't dance worth crap, uh, as you can see. Uh, so, um, so people who don't buy your services, the reason I do these talks is to get out in front of people and to let them see Clefenico. Hey, this guy's cool. He's a lawyer, but he's actually kind of a nice guy. He tells jokes. I, I think I could deal with him. You know, let's face it, most lawyers don't, we don't humanize ourselves at all. We do not. People are scared to talk to lawyers, right? Because you think we're judging you. You screwed up. Ah. I, I, I say, hey, look, you know, people call me. I take the exact opposite approach. Hey, you need a lawyer? Great. That's what I'm here for. Really, I'm glad you screwed up. No, I, I, don't, I don't say it that way. I'm saying, hey, this is I mean, if you, don't, if you haven't screwed up in your life, you don't need a lawyer, right? I'm, I'm perfectly happy. This is, this is what I do. I help people get out of that situation. That's what I do. I'm happy when people, people call me sometimes, clients that I haven't heard from in years. You know, Cliff, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't called you. And so, what are, what are you apologizing for? You haven't needed a lawyer in five years. That's pretty damn good. That's a pretty good track record. I'm worried about why you're calling me now. You know, what the heck's, what the heck's happened? How much, of, how much of your body has the wolf eaten up? That, I'm more worried about that. Okay, um, your marketing strategy has four pillars. Remember, the key to a personal service business is the word personal. People have to see you. You gotta get out in front of people, you can't hide behind the phone and wait for the phone to ring, because it just doesn't happen that way. You gotta get out there and make that phone ring. It will not happen unless you do it, okay? Number one, your involvement in organizations and trade groups, specifically. Your personal interaction with clients and referral sources, including your elevator pitch, your public speaking strategy, and your firm website and LinkedIn profile. Let's talk about each of these now, real quick. Organizations and trade groups. Okay, biggest mistake that people make here, they join organizations of people that look like them. When a young lawyer passes the bar association, the first thing he does, he joins every bar association out there. What's wrong with that? Well, of course, he wants education, he wants support. There's other good things you get out of those, but he's sitting around with a bunch of lawyers. How much business is he gonna get? from other lawyers. Lawyers do not refer people to other lawyers. Let me tell you about that. I'm one of the few that does, believe it or not. You want to join organizations where there's lots of clients, right? So if you're a small business lawyer and you have the option of joining a bar association or joining SCORE, I think you'd be better off joining SCORE, quite frankly, because you're going to see a lot of people starting small businesses. That's exactly the kind of people you want to reach out to. Go where the clients and customers are. Look for as few competitors as possible. Look for organizations where there aren't a whole lot of people like you. You know, so for example, um, you know, if you're a, uh, a realtor, join a couple of organizations where they're, that are not about real estate. 
you know, where you might feel, find some people, everybody sooner or later buys or sells their houses, right? You know, find a couple of organizations where there's lots of other people who may be buying or selling a house, but there's another thing going on with the organization, and that's why you're there. Look for a low flake ratio. This is, this is a personal thing. Now, if you look this up online, you will never see it anywhere. This is a Cliff Enico thing. Every organization has a flake ratio. The flake ratio is the ratio of flaky people to total population. That's the rate ratio. How many crazy, nutty people are there in this organization that you don't want a part of in your life at all? If there's a lot of them, stay away. Every organ some organizations have higher flake ratios than others. I, I will share with you uh, that when I first came to Connecticut and started practicing, you know, out of my house, uh, I joined a local venture group. I won't mention names, uh, but at the very first meeting that I went of this venture group, they sat me next to somebody whose dream business was to create an all-nude Broadway musical based on the novel Madame Bovary. <laughs> that was the longest lunch I have ever had in my life, without a question. I wanted nothing to do with this person. This person was nuts, okay? And if you see a lot of people like that in an organization, get the hell out, because I'll tell you, when we talk about social media, people judge you by the company you keep. If I look on your Facebook page and I see a bunch of yahoos, guess what, I think you're a yahoo too. It's guilt by association, people, and that's just human nature, by the way. Don't hate people for that, that's just human nature. Roll up your sleeves, by the way, if you're gonna join an organization too, don't join it just for the purpose of getting business. You know, get involved, roll up your sleeves, join organizations you believe in. You know, don't just join an organization to get business. Join an organization where you really care. When people see your passion for whatever the organization's purpose is, that will sell you much more effectively than, hi, I'm Cliff Enico, I sell insurance. I hate that. Don't you hate that? You go into a networking group, the first person, it's always a guy, too. It's always a Y chromosome. Hi, I'm so-and-so, I sell life insurance. Yeah, you and 10,000 other people, dude. You know, guess what? You're not gonna get any business out of this whatsoever. You know? By the way, a great technique, by the way, for networking groups, don't give them your card. When someone says, you know, do you have a card? No. Really? You had, no, I, I don't, well, no, I do have one, but to be honest with you, I really don't know you well enough yet to know how I can help you. So I'd rather not just give away a card. You know, yeah, they're cheap, I don't really care about that, but I really only wanna spend time with people I feel I can really help. Uh, so let's talk a little bit. If I find I can help you, then I will certainly give you my card. But right now, we're not at that stage yet. Seriously, it blows people away. They don't expect that. You don't want my card, no. I don't want your card. What you're really thinking is because you're a Yahoo. But what you really are saying to yourself, but no, the, the way you say it is, you don't, tell, don't insult people. But seriously, tell them, you know, I really don't know how I can help you as yet. And until I can do that, you know, I don't really think that this is appropriate. Because let's face it, you, hand out, you go to these networking groups, you hand out all these cards. What do you do when you get home? You throw them right out in the trash, right? That's a waste. Don't do that. Business cards aren't that expensive, but you don't want to waste them either. Personal networking, okay, in your elevator pitch. Okay, big mistake that consultants make. Hi, I'm Cliff Enico. I'm a small business lawyer. What have I just told you? Nothing. Nothing at all. You have no idea what a small business lawyer does, do you? Well, you have some guests. I start, I form businesses. I work with businesses, that kind of stuff. But beyond that, you haven't a clue what I do. Here's the thing about it. When you talk to people, don't tell, say them what you are. Tell them how you make their lives better. Who do you serve? Every bit, remember, this is a service business. And as Bob Dylan once famously sang, you have to serve somebody. Remember that song? You have to serve somebody. Everybody's got to serve somebody. Who do you serve? Who do you care about? Whose lives do you care about enough that you want to make them better in some way? Better, faster, cheaper, whatever. Who do you care about? That's the first question I ask a consulting client. Who do you care about? What? Is it, are we talking about your fees? No, I want to know who do you care about? Who are you serving here? Who's your customer? You know, and how do you make their lives better, faster, cheaper, whatever? That's what I want to know. Okay, get your customers talking about fears and passions, what turns them on, what keeps them awake at night. Easiest thing in the world to do. These are the three things that we like to talk about more than anything else in the world. When you get together with your friends after work, when you go to a family Thanksgiving dinner, what do you spend 95% of your time talking about? The things that turn you on, the things that get you excited, and the things that keep you awake at night, the things that worry you. Get them talking. This makes people like you, believe it or not. Uh, social psychologists tell us that we are attracted or not attracted to certain people based on how much we think they empathize or, or at least uh, I'm sorry, they, they sympathize or empathize with our fears and passions. When you meet somebody at a cocktail party or a networking group and they don't share or at least empathize with your fears and passions, what's the takeaway? Well, nice person, but really I don't get them. They're, they're, you know, I, just, I just don't understand them. You don't hate them, but you just don't understand them either. Whereas when you come away from a meeting with someone where they clearly understand who you are and they, and they at least express an interest in your fears and passions, it's much easier to like that person, isn't it? 
In fact, social psychologists tell us that this is how we pick our friends and lovers, by the way. Uh, op on a superficial level, opposites do attract. Our friends and lovers may not look anything at all like us, but deeper down, it's very hard to fall in love with someone who does not share or at least empathize with your fears and passions. Dig a little deeper, the fears and passions have to be aligned. Your elevator pitch, okay, let's talk about this. Don't say who you are. Hi, I'm Cliff Enico, I sell life insurance. That's a, that, that's a, that's a conversation stopper. Talk about who your clients are, how you improve their lives, talk about your competitive advantage, and then tell them a compelling story to help them remember you. Dirty little secret, when you're at a networking group, five minutes after you've had that conversation with somebody and you've talked to them for 10 minutes, that person has totally forgotten who you are. They have your card, they might remember place the name with the card, but they really don't remember you. You have to be memorable. That is the key. Here, I'll give you an example. Here are two elevator pitches for two different businesses. It's an actual business, a business I ran back in the 1990s. Both are 100% accurate, but I guarantee you're going to like one more than the other. Elevator pitch number one. Hi, I'm Cliff Enico. I'm president of Bionics Corporation. We are a uh, career, legal career management firm specializing uh, in the legal vertical. We're a career management firm specializing in the legal vertical. I said it twice. You still haven't a clue what I'm talking about, right? Okay. Now, second elevator pitch for the same company. Hi, I'm Cliff Enico. I'm president of Bionics Corporation. We are the leading publisher of books, audio tapes, and seminars for lawyers and other members of the legal community to help them with their career management issues. We're not helping them practice law. We're helping them get jobs, keep them, and attract clients. One of our, seminar, one of our books, The Legal Job Interview, How to Win the Law-Related Job in Any Market, was the book most frequently stolen from law libraries around the country, according to a recent law librarian survey. Now, that one was a lot longer, obviously, right? Which one do you like better, though? The second one told you who I was, right? We're a publishing company. We deal with the legal career issues of lawyers, right? Uh, I, I made it very clear. I told you how we distinguish ourselves from all other law book companies. We're not teaching people how to practice law. We're teaching something else. And I told you that cute story. Uh, and I'm very proud, by the way. That is actually a real book. I wrote it. For five years running in the 1990s, I wrote the book that was most frequently stolen from law libraries around the country. Now, that doesn't say much about the ethics of my profession, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But isn't that great dust jacket copy? You know, I, I wanted that survey. You know, I wanted that on the back of all my books. I mean, how bad can this book be if people are stealing it? It's amazing. People will remember that story. I have met people who haven't seen me in years who say, you're the guy that wrote that book that was stolen from libraries, right? They remember that. That sticks in their head. Be memorable. That's very important when you're doing personal marketing. Okay. Public speaking. Always volunteer to meet at local organization meetings. Um, when I was first starting my practice as a publication, uh, I won't mention it, so it's called the Something County Business Journal. In the back, they have a column called The Agenda, and it's nothing more than a listing of meetings. Every county, every town in the U.S. has a publication like this. It lists all the local business meetings that are happening that week, that month, that whatever. I got the list, and of course, they always tell you who the program director is and what the phone number is. I went down that list. I called every one. I called every number, and I said, hi, I'm Cliff Enico. I'm a new lawyer in town. I see you have an organization of uh, managerial accountants. Uh, I'd love to speak to your lunch group at some point. Here are a couple of topics I think might be of interest to your, 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 your lunch group. How many times do you think I got rejected doing this? Answer, not once was I rejected. The usual response was, wow, how'd you hear about us? Yeah, we didn't think we were on anybody's radar screen, right? Let me tell you something. These organizations are volunteer organizations. These people that work for them are volunteers, right? The program director has a full-time job. They're working 90 hours a week. Their biggest problem is, who am I going to have to speak to our lunch meeting this month who's not terrible? You call out of the blue and you volunteer, that is manna from heaven. Very rarely will they say no. Really. I mean, sir, the one problem you will have, you, you will dine out a lot on their expense. You'll get a lot of free food here. And that is bad for your waistline. <laughs> Take a good look at me, ladies and gentlemen. I did not look like this when I started this marketing program. Okay? You know, seriously, when you're eating lunch, when you're doing two or three talks a week for various business groups, you're going to gain 30 pounds. Do not lose your gym membership, whatever you do. You got to keep that sucker up. Secondly, talk, talk about yourself. When you're up there speaking, I'm not talking about how I practice law and here's what I do and what I don't. That's a waste of time. You don't care. I'm talking about you, your problems, your fears, your passions, and how, that, how we can address those. That's what we're talking about. Use lots of stories, illustrations. People remember stories, but don't offend. 
I remember one time I was uh, on a pro I was program chair for the local bar association, and we paid serious money to have this guy fly out from California. He was one of the big firms in Los Angeles to talk about some new development in the law. I think it was the Americans with Disabilities Act back in the early 90s. I can't remember which one it was. He was like the leading expert on this statute. So we paid like a couple of thousand dollars to have him come and speak to our bar. Had a huge crowd, about 500 lawyers in this room, right? So this guy gets up there, and I, we had lunch with him before. He seemed like an awfully nice guy, right? He gets up there and he tells the absolute worst dirty joke. Not only was it filthy, but it wasn't funny. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, not appropriate for a legal meeting, right? A bar association meeting. Also, too, I will share with you that the vast majority of people in that audience were female. Ladies, how do you react when someone tells a dirty joke? Not good, right? This guy, I mean, you could hear a pin drop uh, during his entire talk. Me and the other organizers were kind of sinking under the table with this guy. Be very careful. Do not offend. And it's very hard now. People are much more sensitive than they used to be. It's much easier to offend people than they used to be. But here's my key for public speaking. And this is the first thing I, first time I ever spoke publicly. Uh, it was a local bar association thing. I was a young lawyer, six years out of six months out of law school. Uh, I was speaking for one of my partners. Um, the partner, as I was leaving the door, as I was leaving the office to go do the talk, he said, "Cliff, just remember one thing: if you can't keep them awake, you can't teach them nothing." And that is the best advice anyone will ever give you. No matter how, these days, people's attention spans are shrinking like this. These days, I can't do a straight PowerPoint anymore. I got to be a circus act. I gotta stand on my head, do a breakdance routine, and whistle Dixie 10 times. That's what people wanna see. You gotta be entertaining. Infotainment, marketainment, edutainment, those are all new words. Learn what they mean. You gotta be colorful. If you have a choice between colorful and being deep, choose the colorful every time. Okay, last but not least on marketing, your website and LinkedIn profile, what should appear there, what you do in plain English. Take a look at some point at my website, at Cliff Ennick. The worst offenders here are lawyers, okay? Take a look at my website for my law practice, which is cliffenico.com. What you'll see, your, your website should only have information that is relevant to your clients. Lawyers are the worst offenders here. Show me a law firm website, and I will show you a website where 90% where of the stuff up there has, is totally useless and will not get that firm a single dollar worth of business. First of all, the first thing that the lawyer puts up there is his photo or her photo. Let me share something with you, folks. Most lawyers should not put their photos up on their websites. But, uh, many of them do, because let's face it, there's two reasons for that. Number one, do people really care if their lawyers are good looking or butt ugly? Do you care, really, what your lawyer looks like? Well, maybe if you're on trial for your life, you might care a little bit. Maybe criminal defense lawyers have to be a certain, you know, macho kind of person to seduce a jury or whatever. But except for that, I don't think you really care. Also, too, many, many lawyers have faces that would frighten small children. I will tell you that right now. Seriously, you know, definitely have your shot professionally taken. And seriously, if, if, if you are, well, if you, if you do not think of yourself as particularly good, you, there's no law that says you have to have your photo up there. There's none whatsoever. You know, when I designed my website, I did four things. First of all, I do have my photo up there. Not because uh, of my law practice. A lot of people look at my website because they want to hire me as a speaker. And people who hire speakers do want to know what you look like. So I do have the photo there for that reason. But then... I say, I don't say what I, the words small business lawyer do not appear anywhere on my website. What I say is, hi, if you have a startup or growing business, here are some of the things I can do to help you. And I have a bunch of bullets, forming corporation, forming limited liability company, drafting contracts. You hear a lot of repetition in there? I do that deliberately because I've learned that's how people search for things. People don't look for a small business lawyer. They look for lawyer to draft contract. So what's bullet number one? Draft contracts. They look for a lawyer to form an LLC, form LLC. I'm doing SEO here by doing this. By saying what I do as opposed to what I am, I'm getting a better SEO uh, presence online by doing that, okay? Then the second thing I have, I have a little paragraph of things that I don't do, and that's just to manage my own time. I don't do litigation, I don't do patents. I don't wanna waste your time, I don't wanna waste my time either. If you have a patent, you need a patent filed, I cannot help you and I want you to know that up front. Then the third thing I have up there, and there are lawyers in this state who think that I am the antichrist because I do this. I put my fee structure up on my website. I put it there. Most of the thing I, things I do are flat fee. I tell you what the flat fees are. They're right there. And I honor them. Why? Because I've learned there are only two things that people care about when they hire a lawyer. Can you do the job and can I afford you? And people are afraid to talk to lawyers about fees. They hate asking about money. They think we're somehow above that. 
Not true. We are the worst when it comes to stuff like that. So what's on my website, other than my photo? What I do for folks and how much I charge. And then at the very bottom, the fourth thing, and this was just a lucky accident. At the very end, I couldn't think of how to end it, basically. I wanted to have a call to action. I wanted to say, you still have questions, call me. You know, my contact information. So I put down at the very bottom, still have questions, question mark, call me, dot, dot, dot. I don't bite. <laughs> Seriously, I cannot tell you how many times people have called me to say, when I saw that, la that tagline at the end of your, I knew that you were the lawyer I wanted to work with. Because let's face it, we don't humanize ourselves. That statement humanized, it made you laugh. A lawyer making you laugh. I'm inviting you in. Call me. I'm not going to bite your head off. Call me. You know, I want you to do that. You know, that's the whole thing. So that's my website. I'm not saying every website should look like mine, but that's how you do your website. There shouldn't be anything there that your clients don't care about. LinkedIn, I mean, I could do a whole course on LinkedIn, but we're not going to talk about that. But here are the two basic rules for LinkedIn. Watch out who you admit into your, your profile. Uh, I'm very careful with my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I, do not let every, I do not let the world in there. If, if, to be on my LinkedIn profile, I have to have worked with you and known you for at least two to three years. Seriously, now that may be too restrictive. But I, frankly, I want people to know that when they see somebody in my LinkedIn profile, that person's good. That's what I want to know. This person is as good as I am, or at least I think they are. I want them to know that. If, again, if I go on your LinkedIn profile and I see you with a bunch of yahoos, I'm going to think that you're a yahoo too. Guilt by association. Also remember, social media is two ways. If you want to have friends, you must be a friend. You know, if I'm going to go on my LinkedIn profile and ask you to buy copies of my new book, you also have the right to go on my LinkedIn profile and ask me to sponsor your next uh, 5K run for cancer or something like that. Okay. Let's talk about your consulting contracts. Okay, real quickly. Most larger clients, you don't have to worry about this. You won't need a client, a contract form for them. They have their form of contract that's usually 30, 40 pages long. Uh, they will want you to sign that. Just remember, nothing is standard. These contracts can be negotiated. These aren't like bank loan documents. You can negotiate these. Have a lawyer look at them. After two or three times, you probably won't need the lawyer anymore because the same issues keep cropping up uh, over and over again. But the first couple of times, have a lawyer look at them. For smaller and mid-sized clients, you will need your own suite of contracts, though. So a lot of smaller clients do not have contract forms of their own. They will expect you to do them. Uh, to have a set of contracts and actually I have a service where for a flat fee I will prepare a suite of uh, consulting contracts uh, it's about $500 uh, that I will do a confident here are the contracts you need a confidentiality and non-disclosure a short form two three page consulting agreement a subcontractor agreement for when you bring on subcontractors and a statement of work let's talk about the statement of work first the statement of work is not a legal document it is just a the business stuff it is a checklist sometimes it's just one page and sometimes it's in bullet form and here's what needs to be there description of services timetable for completion list of deliverables the clients responsibilities what they are expected to produce and give you list of subcontractors if you're subcontracting any of the work out the locations where the services are to be provided are you working out of your home are you expected to be in their office three days a week and then any special terms and conditions that are unique to the contract the statement of work is an exhibit you prepare it and then you slap it on to your standard form contract as exhibit a the contract always stays the same but the exhibit a changes with each new client and each new project that you take on as for the as for the contract itself okay Believe it or not, I can live with a lot of ambiguity in a consulting contract as long as three things are crystal clear. I can live with, I can live with a sloppy contract as long as three things are, are crystal clear. What services are you going to perform? How much money will you be paid? And most importantly, when will payment be due? especially number three. You, do, you have no idea how many contracts I see that are very clear on the first two, but when it comes to that third thing, things get a little vague. And you do not want a vague contract. You want to know exactly what day, hour, and minute you are going to get your payment or you're legally entitled to collect your payment. You do not want any ambiguity there. Yes, 30 days after I send you my invoice. Yes, uh, honor before June 30th, uh, 2015. The client wants you to sign a contract saying you'll be paid upon completion. No, don't agree to that. Why? When is, it, when is, when is completion? When is the project complete? I work with a lot of web developers. Any web developers here? When is, a web when is a website completed? Never. 
It's never done. There's always little tweaks and punch list stuff that has to be done. If you let that language in your contract, the client can drag you on for months and you can't do a thing about it because the contract doesn't say when you're entitled to payment. Uh, never ever sign a contract that says you get paid when, you're, when the client is satisfied. That is an absolute no-no because clients are never satisfied. And then also know upon client acceptance. I do not like acceptance clauses when it comes to stuff like that. I want to see a fixed date. If you want, you can say um, uh, payment is due uh, upon client acceptance, but in no event later than 90 days after something specific. You can do that. Put an outside date on it. Okay? Ooh. There we go. Okay, here are some other trouble spots in the contract. Warranties. Always try to disclaim warranties. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's perfectly okay to say in a contract, I will do the work to the best of my professional ability and in accordance with industry standards. That's perfectly okay. But don't ever guarantee results. In fact, I think you should go the other way. In all my retainer letters and all my contracts, I always have a little less sign of thing that says, I do not guarantee that you will achieve a specific result even if you tell me what it is. I cannot guarantee results. I can only guarantee that I'll do the work to my best. Even if I, even if I spend a thousand hours and form the best corporation in the world for you, I cannot guarantee that you will not be sued. I don't know. I can't predict that. No one can predict that. Be very careful because managing clients' expectations is what the contract is all about. A limitation of liability clause. Always, includes a, always include a clause in your agreement that says that even if I do screw up, even if I do blow the pooch, I am I'm only liable for whatever it is you've paid me. All I have to do is give you your money back and you can't sue me, you can't take my house away from me. Always throw that clause in there. Some people like to limit it to 100 bucks or something like that. I don't like that, the courts really don't like that. But if you put a clause in there that says, uh, in, the, in the event that I really do screw up, my only obligation is to give you your money back, most courts will enforce that. Uh, and at least it know, you, you know at least what the maximum amount of your liability is going to be. Here's a tough one, assignment of rights and work product. You're doing work for a client, you're creating some deliverable for them, and the client puts a clause in your contract that says that you, will, you, you hereby assign to the client all of your rights to this work product. Okay? Well, let me tell you something. When you do that, what you're doing is you're selling that work product to them. That means you cannot use it for anybody else in your consulting practice. That's what that means. So be very careful. First of all, if a client insists on that kind of language, I always put language in there saying, provided the client pays all amounts due to me in full, I will assign. Make sure you get paid. And then also exclude tools and materials and work product created for other clients. There's specific language that I use for this. Any work that you do for other clients, they don't have any rights to. And any materials that you use, like templates and forms, that you use for all of your clients generally should be carved out of that. I mean, I use forms and templates all the time when I draft contracts. You know, the specific contract that I do for a client, I'm probably not gonna use that for anybody else, but the template I'm using over and over again. I don't want the client to have rights to that template. Uh, here's some other trouble spots, insurance. Most clients these days are going to want you uh, not just to have insurance, but insurance in specific amounts. We talked about this, general liability, errors and omissions. Uh, does anybody here know what a waiver of subrogation is? This is something you have to talk to your insurance uh, company about. When, you, when, when, when something bad happens, let's say that you do, do a, a project for somebody and you do make a mistake, uh, the client sues you and your insurance company pays the liability, okay? Well, in most insurance policies is a clause called subrogation that says that at that point, they take over and they get whatever rights you had to sue somebody else. So let's say, for example, you had a subcontractor and the subcontractor was the one who blew it. You, 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 your insurance pays the liability, the client is paid off, but now under that subrogation clause, your insurance company now wants to go after the subcontractor the person who really screwed up. What a waiver of subrogation clause says is that the insurance company cannot do that. Once the insurance company pays out, they can't sue nobody. That's what a waiver of subrogation clause. Some insurers will not let you sign a waiver of subrogation clause. So before you sign a waiver of subrogation clause, it'll usually say waiver of subrogation. Talk to your insurance company, find out what you can and cannot do. Non-compete clauses, never sign them. Really, seriously, I'm actually thinking, nobody, no consultant should ever sign a client say that I will not work uh, for, you know, another company in the same industry for two years. That's ridiculous. You should never sign it. If anybody asks you to sign that, go running to an attorney immediately because you need help. Uh, that can block you out of doing business. Non-solicitation clauses, though, are a different matter. A non-solicitation clause is something that says, um, for, a period, for, for, for as long as we're working together and for a period of two years, you will not solicit business from any of our customers, employees, you won't hire away our employees, those are okay. Those the courts are much more likely to enforce. 
uh, as opposed to a naked non-compete that says you won't compete with them. Um, those are okay, but be very careful. Try to limit it. So, for example, some non-solicitation clauses that I see will say, you shall not solicit or accept business from one of our customers. So let's say, for example, you do work for a company, one of the customers sees you, they think you're great, and now three weeks later, the customer calls you and says, hey, uh, we bumped into each other when you were doing that job for XYZ Corp. We really like your work. We want to hire you. If you sign a clause saying you will not solicit or accept business, you can't say, you cannot have that conversation. You have to hang up. Is you, that's what you told them that you that's what you told the company you would do so be very careful there's little these things get very language specific uh, there no, they are there these are not boilerplate uh, terms and conditions get a lawyer to help you assignment and subcontracting clauses make very sh clear that you're allowed to subcontract if you have to if you get sick or something like that you can't complete a job make sure that the client uh, allows you to subcontract as long as the subcontractor is reasonably acceptable to them most uh, clients will let you do that and then the governing law the choice of forum you do not want to be dragged to California in the event that you have a lawsuit with one of your clients uh, don't assume the governing law clause I mean most companies want to have that be in their home territory of course because they want to litigate on their home turf but uh, there are ways you can negotiate that language don't ever assume that anything is boilerplate okay subcontract here are the important provisions that need to be there. You want to be sure you are very clear who's going to do what. So let's say, for example, you're an IT consultant. Uh, you're doing work for a company, but the client also wants some web design. You're not a web designer, so you bring in my friend over here who's a web designer as a subcontractor, and the two of you are going to work together. You want to be very clear in the subcontract who's going to do what. Does the subcontractor get to contact the client directly or only through you? Let me tell you a dirty little secret about subcontractors. They all want to steal your clients. Right? You bring in a subcontractor, inevitably the client likes them better than they like you. And, they're, and, that's, and if the subcontractor is a nasty person, they're going to try to go behind your back. We call that circumvention. You want to have some language in there like that says that you know, for a period of one year, uh, the subcontractor will not solicit business from any client or any person that you introduce to them. Uh, that's very common. And then last but not least, we call this the monkey in the middle clause. Make sure there's a clause in there that says that the subcontract gets paid only when you actually receive money. You don't want to be in a situation where you owe your subcontractor money, but the client owes money to you. That's called the monkey in the middle problem. And if you remember that game from childhood, the monkey in the middle was not an enviable place to be. And this is not the, and it's the same here. So those are the clauses you need in your subcontracts. Also, too, another thing to watch out for here, watch out for the inadvertent partnership. Okay? Mo, Larry, and Curly come to my office. They're working on a project together. You've got to use the Three Stooges. Okay? It's just, it's, there's a federal law. You've got to use the Three Stooges. Mo, Larry, and Curly, you know, I hire a firm. Mo, Larry, and Curly come over. They're doing this job for me. They're all working together. They're all yelling and screaming, slapping each other and all this stuff. I think they're partners, right? So something bad happens. I don't know who to sue. I don't know who screwed up. So I sue all three of them. And then they all come back with lawyers saying, well, wait a minute, we weren't partners. Uh, Mo was the real guy you contracted with. We're Larry and Curly are just subcontractors. Well, guess what, folks? I didn't know nothing about that. They didn't say nothing about that. So guess what? The law says I can treat them as partners. I can sue all of them, even though it was Mo who really screwed up. So be careful. Make sure whenever you're doing work with a subcontractor that you disclose to the client that you are subcontracting. This is not, this fellow over here is not my partner. This person here is my subcontractor. Make sure the client knows that. Okay, otherwise the two of you could be liable for each other's screw-ups. That's what, that's what partners are all about. All for one, one for all, we all go down together. You do not want to be in that situation with somebody you barely know. Okay, what happens when clients don't pay? Stop work immediately. This is the, uh, probably the fourth biggest thing that consultants make mistakes on. The minute you have a problem of collecting a receivable, stop working. Stop digging that hole. Big receivables problems almost always start out as small ones that get out of hand. Okay? Well, the minute you see a client is paying late, stop. Talk to the client, work something out, but don't keep working. Don't keep making that bill bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, because the longer it goes on, the less likely it is you're going to get paid. Work out a payment schedule or a reduction in the amounts owed, and always put a clause in your client that says, I call it the two strikes, you're out clause. If you have failed to make payments on time twice within 12-month period, I have the right to terminate the relationship, and good luck. That's a clause that should be in all your contracts. 
Mediation, arbitration, small claims court. I have some stuff on my website if you want to know about small claims court. But here's a great trick, by the way. I, if, a question that people always like to ask is, can I go medieval? Can I go postal? The answer is you really can't. There's federal laws that say you can't do that. Uh, it's called the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that restricts how you can collect debts and stuff like that. But here's a dirty little trick, and I really, oh, I think I'm, I'm okay saying it on video. I, I think it's such a cute, a client of mine actually does this, and it's absolutely brilliant. If you ever get a client that owes you a significant amount of money and you know the client is never going to pay you, you know. Here's a great trick. Write the debt off. Call them up and say, I forgive the debt. You know what? It's quite clear you're never going to pay me here, Joe. I'm forgiving the debt. And send them a letter, certified mail, saying this is to confirm that I am forgiving the amount that you owe me in the amount of 15000 But I am not going to, you know, we're not going to do business ever again, but I am forgiving this debt. You don't owe it to me. Have fun, have a nice life. Yours very truly, whatever. Okay, send it by certified mail. The client, of course, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then wait till January and send them a 1099. MISC, 1099 miscellaneous. You know why? Because if you know anything about tax law, if you forgive a debt, that's income to the debtor. If someone forgives my mortgage, it's like someone put that money in my pocket and the IRS recognizes this. So you send them a 1099. So now, I mean, you're still not going to get your money back, but now they got to pay taxes to the IRS and you send a copy of that sucker to the IRS. Again, it's all there. You send them a letter by certified mail. You forgave the debt. He didn't question it. You got him. Justice. You know, the world is just, <laughs> the world is just. We call that the old 1099 trick. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Let's keep going. Okay. Growing your practice here. Uh, I refer to this as the 24-7. When you are a consultant, you are selling your time at the end of the day. You're not really selling services. You're selling your time. And there's only 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. Consulting is a non-scalable business. That means in order to grow your business, you have to add people and spend more money. Okay? Hiring, training employees, interns. Do you want to be a manager rather than a doer? This is the question you have to face. I'm wrestling with this right now. Uh, somebody asked me just at, uh, at dinner uh, tonight, you know, Cliff, are you still doing all this crap yourself? And the answer is yes, because I don't want to grow a firm. I just don't want to be a manager. I'm, I'm perfectly happy practicing law. I don't really want to grow a firm and become a manager. I, being responsible for in my, my students and my interns and my young lawyers' mistakes. I don't want that. Uh, and I'm perfectly, some people want to build an empire. That's great. But keep in mind that the more you hire people, the more you're going to end up supervising them and being a manager and being less the professional that you want to be. Um, and then also a big problem you have is making sure your employees don't steal your clients. Okay, uh, that's, a, that's something else too. Inevitably, once you, once you delegate too much to an employee, the client gets to view them as their lawyer, consultant, whatever, and you have lost the client. Okay, selling your practice, exit strategy. Every business has an exit strategy. What's yours gonna be? I'm gonna work till I drop. I'm gonna work till I'm 90. Seriously, I have, people, I have people tell me that. The nice thing about being a consultant, you can work as long as you have functioning brain cells. So in my case, I still got a couple of year, good years left that I can do, okay? Um, but it, there may come a time when you wanna sell it. When it comes time, make sure you sell the assets of your business. Don't sell them your LLC, sell them the assets of the business. That way, uh, they don't assume any liabilities uh, other than the ones that they specifically agree to assume. Uh, they will want it that way. And, um, and now you will be asked to sign a non-compete, by the way, so make sure that that, uh, that language is very uh, carefully drafted. Expect a royalty arrangement. For a personal service business, people are not gonna pay you $300,000. What's gonna, what they're gonna do instead is they're gonna say something like this. They're gonna say, here's the deal, Cliff. I'm gonna pay you 25,000 up front. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna give me your client list. We're gonna, we're gonna make this an exhibit to the contract. And any business that I get from your clients for the next five years, I will give you 25% of the gross production or 20%. It's usually 15, 20, 25%. That's called a royalty. I'm getting a royalty on your sales from my clients for the next five years. Any new business that you bring in, that's yours. You get to keep it. I don't get a piece of it. But anything that comes from my client list, these people that you would not have known about if you had not bought my practice, I, I will get 15, 20, 25 percent of the gross for a period of usually it's three to five years. Why do you do it that way? Because that gives you an incentive to hang around and make sure that that person, that that person keeps your clients. Um, the, the, the medical association here in our state has told me that when an old doctor retires and sells out to a, uh, a younger doctor, how many of the patients do you think leave at, during the first two years? What percent? Anybody want to guess? Close, 60%. 
at, in this state, and we'll mention what that is, but you know, other states may be different, but on average, when a young doctor sells out to an, a, young, a, a younger doctor, 60% of the patients change doctors in the next two years, right? You definitely want to make sure that old doctor hangs around and manages. If I'm that young doctor, I want to make, and I'm putting you know, a quarter of a million dollars into this practice you know, for equipment and stuff, I want to make sure that old doctor hangs around and helps. And then the last thing is when you sell your practice, always ask for a tail on your errors and omissions policy. That's a clause that says that they will, if you, if you made a mistake before you sold your practice, they will still cover you even if the lawsuit is brought, is brought three to five years later. That's called a tail. Always make sure you have a tail on your E&O is malpractice coverage. Think of it as malpractice coverage, the same as a lawyer has. Okay, we're almost done. Here's what we've covered. Okay, all the things that we've talked about. Here are some excellent books that will help you if you are starting a solo consulting practice. You will notice they have two very, very good things in common. And this is indeed what I look like. Some of you, see, if you look at the photo on my website, I do look like that when I lose about 50, 60 pounds. It's not quite fraud yet. Uh, but it's heading in that, <laughs> but it is heading in that direction. This one is a little bit, I did use a little bit of a wide angle thing. I'm really not a PowerPoint person. Um, but this is all my contact information with my, some of my websites. And that is it. Uh, that's really all I have to say. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've been very patient and you've just been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. <laughs> For the public record, four seconds left to go on the timer. Okay, so those of you who think I don't look at the timer, uh, there you go. Okay. Um, the books, uh, could you put that one back up again? Of uh, the books, sure, you bet. Okay, these are two of my best sellers. Seriously, go to Amazon and click on Cliff Enico. That's what I go by. I've written 15 books. Some are for lawyers, some are for regular folks, but these are two of my best sellers. If you know anybody, by the way, who sells on eBay, this has become the Bible. Uh, for eBay sellers. Uh, eBay actually endorses this book, uh, recommends this book to their new sellers. Uh, it's, it's the best book on tax and legal issues for uh, people who sell at retail uh, online, uh, for what that's worth. So, okay, so any questions at all that I can answer either on legal topics or not? Was that good? Boy, that's rare. Madam, do I have any advice for women on how to do this? Okay, first of all, I don't really think that women and men sell all that differently. The real, the real difference is, how do you add value to the customer's life? When you're selling to someone, um, uh, you know, I don't think there's a male and a female way of selling. There are some people who are more, from, more comfortable with female consultants. So for example, if I'm selling to a client, uh, a law firm, let's say, that has predominantly female partners, I will bring a female colleague to that meeting because I want them to know that, that I'm female friendly. Um, that that would be one reason, for example. But that's, I really don't think, it depends on the services that you're providing. Uh, I will tell you, when it comes to web designers, there are two kinds of web designers. And there really is, I think, a sexual difference between them. There's, there's one kind that really is great at design. They can make the pages just look beautiful and pop, and they know everything there is to know about colors, but the sites are slow and clunky, and they don't work very well. Then there's the second type of web designer who really understands how to make things flow and they'll have the site move quickly and go from page to page and page, but they just don't have a sense of design so the site looks but ugly. I, I do find that there is a male-female correlation very often between those two kinds of web designers. I'm just, just that one particular group. You know, the females tend to be more on the design side and the guys tend to be better with the technology, but that's not a stereotype. That's just one example, for example. So if I'm looking for a web designer, I always have to ask myself, you know, what am I looking for? And I might be a little prejudiced toward the female if I'm looking, on, I'm looking at the design side, just because I think that they'll do a better job. Yes? The whole question, the question you're asking is, is it better to have employees or independent contractors in certain environments? And it, really, it's a tough thing. I always say, did you ever read Machiavelli, The Prince? You know, the, the book of political you know, strategy, the Renaissance guy? And one of his chapters, he talks about military. And he says, you know, if you really want to protect your city, you must make sure to have troops of your own. Never rely on mercenaries, he says, because mercenaries have a nasty habit of going with whoever pays them the most. They have no loyalties. These are just hired swords or hired guns, you know. So that would be the best advice, I think, comes from Machiavelli there. I think if you're really trying to build a brand and grow a successful, I see a lot of young people today doing what I call virtual companies where there are no employees. It's just, you know, there's a CEO and then there's a bunch of people all working 1099 part time. Uh, well, first of all, those people have to watch out about the employee versus independent contractor thing. You know, if you're working 20 hours a week, you know, at set times for this company, you are not an independent contractor. You're an employee. 
uh, in the IRS's eyes. But also, too, they have to ask yourself, what's the value here? You know, I mean, someone's working for me, and they're working for, you know, for, for, they're living on Red Bull, they're working 80 hours a week, but all of a sudden they get a full-time job, boom, they're going to be gone, and guess what? They own 20% of my company, because uh, that's what I offered them when they came on board. I have a little problem with the virtual company. I don't think you can run a company with 100% independent contractors, and although that does not stop a lot of big companies from trying. Uh, it certainly doesn't. Any other questions? Sir? Yeah, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not in the military. What industry is not? Uh, shrinking right now. I mean, seriously. I mean, we're going to a totally virtual world, you know. Uh, by the way, I have another YouTube video up on my YouTube channel, which you want to look at. Uh, it's one I recorded just recently called The Four Horsemen of Corporate America, as, it's, as in the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Uh, what is it? War, Famine, Pestilence, and Death. Right. Seriously, uh, it's, it's actually one of my most requested talk, and I have it up on my YouTube channel, about four megatrends that are driving the corporate job market right now. It's not a very exciting talk. I will warn you, you might have some liquor handy uh, when you listen to this one. Not, not, not so much this one. This is one of the better ones. Uh, but seriously, if you really want to know what's going on in the economy today, that's one YouTube video that I would refer you to. The question is, you come from a commercial banking background. You have a military background. That tells me too, a lot about you. Um, I would think that you, what you want to do is you want to go out and consult to banks, but don't not necessarily on the operations or whatever it was that you were doing for your former or your current commercial employer. Yeah, but coming from a military background, you also have a lot of credibility, which you may not recognize you have, in uh, training and development and incurring and instilling discipline in people. A lot of organizations have trouble with discipline now because, let's face it, they did away with the draft 50 years ago or 45 years ago. A lot of people don't have a military background, and, and, and the military gives you many things, but one of the things it gives you is organizational discipline. Show me someone who's been in the military, and I will show you a very, very good worker and a very loyal worker and a very hard-working person, all right? By teaching those kinds of skills, especially to, to companies that have a lot of younger workers, I think that's an area, now that's HR, that's not something that you've historically done, but because of your background, I think you'd have a very strong credit. That's an example, perfect example, by the way, what I meant by not being limited to what's on your resume right. and not being a prisoner of your resume. Use a little creativity. You have a lot to teach people more than just the specific technical things that you did when you were working for your former employer. In fact, if I if I can bore you for about five minutes, uh, I want to share a story with you. There's good news and there's bad news here about consulting. The good news is, even in this crappy economy, there, is, there are tons of jobs available for good consultants. There's a ton of work available for good consultants. There is. That's the good news. But here's the bad news. Very little of that work is stuff that's on your resume right now, today. The kind of things, the kind of jobs that companies need done are going to be at an angle to the stuff that you have done historically and that what appears on your resume. Maybe a small angle, maybe an obtuse angle, okay? That's where it's going to be. Sooner or later, if, you, if you're successful and you, you, you pitch a company and they like you, I guarantee sooner or later you're going to have this conversation. The person's going to say to you, you know what, Joe? I like you. I really think you're, you're, you're taking a very nice view of this. I really like the way you handle yourself here. Listen, I got this little job over here. It's a, a frugal premise. That's just, that's just a made-up word. Uh, it's a frugal premise project. Uh, I do have a little budget for it, but I don't want to put any of my full-timers on it. We're looking for someone from outside the organization to do it. Uh, can you help us with this? Because really, we could use some help. We want to get this job done quickly. Whatever the frugal premise is, I guarantee it is something you yourself, it is relevant to your field. It is something you kind of know about. But it's not on your resume. It's not something you've ever actually done, okay? Here's how a loser handles that situation. Oh, uh, well, uh, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I, I don't, I don't, Jackie Gleason, The Honeymooners, 1950. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I just don't know any, I, I mean, frugal frames, I can know, I, I just, I've never done it. I don't know anybody else who does. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, this isn't, this isn't something I'm comfortable with. That's how, a, and at that point, of course, the interview's over. The only reason you were in that person's office was because they wanted to get that frugal premise project in somebody's hands, right? Here's how a winner handles this. I'm going to pick you in the front row here just because, you know, I, well, also I know you too. I know you don't bite. Um, but I'm just going to look, I'm gonna straight in the eye, look him straight in the eye, say, frugal premise? Yep, I can help you with that. <laughs> Smile, eye contact, do not show fear. Do not show fear because they can spot, they're like Rottweilers. They can spot, <laughs> they can smell fear. Guarantee if you do this, the response is going to be, Really? You know about frugal framus? Because let me tell you what's happening here. This guy has been trying for months to get this frugal framus project off his desk, right? He's interviewed dozens of people. No one feels comfortable with it. And you know why? 
because nobody knows how to do frugal fairness. There's nobody out there who's done this crap before. Nobody. What that tells you, you know as much as all of your competitors. You know as much as anybody who's out there. Remember the line, I don't remember where it's from, I think it's from the Bible. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed person is king. You ever hear that? This is that situation, okay? You know as much as anybody else, so why shouldn't you get the gig and do it and become the frugal pharmacy expert? No, seriously, here's what because I guarantee. So what you do, here's what you do, right? You, you, you say yes, uh, the guy's gonna say, well, how much do you charge? Remember, you're gonna have some learning time in here. This is not something you've done before, so make sure you price high. Do not underprice this job, otherwise you really will be cheating yourself. Then, when you get when you get the deal, get the deal, get the handshake on the elevator, going down to the lobby. That's when you go, "Holy crap! What did I just do? <laughs> what did I just do?" And let's face it, you're going to go out, you're going to go home, you're going to buy frugal frames for dummies. You'll learn how to do it. It's not rocket science. It is in your field. It's something you should know how to do. This is how you learn, people. You know, you weren't born knowing the things that you do, do, how to do things that you know how to do today. You, you know how to do these things because someone gave you a frugal premise and you had to figure it out. Okay, that's how you learn. I'm just saying, keep it up. This is how opportunities come in the real world. When you're out there pitching consulting stuff, throw your net widely, see what comes in, like any good fisherman or fisher person does. You know, sooner or later, someone's gonna throw you a frugal premise. Say yes, figure out how to do it, and let it take you where it's gonna take you because it might just take you to someplace really, really fantastic. I love telling that story, not just because it's about me, but because it's exactly how this world works. You can go out there pitching A, B, C, D, and E for years, but if everybody's asking for F, then F is what you should be doing. Figure out how to do it, add it to your arsenal, and make it happen because that's, it's not about what you can do, it's about what the world wants. Learn how to do it. Ma'am, you were dying to ask a question before. The, the real question you're asking, the question is basically, <clears throat> there's something you really want to do, but it requires certain education, certain training, and you're not likely to get a, a job offer unless you have those letters after your name. Well, you kind of answered the question yourself, which is, if you don't have the letters after your name, you're not likely to get that kind of, you're not going to get that kind of work. You can want to be a patent lawyer as much as you want to be, but if you don't have a law degree, it's not, you're not gonna get anywhere, and if you have an engineering degree on top of it, you're not gonna be much good, even if you have a law degree. I wouldn't be a very good patent lawyer. So the, I guess the question is, you, you decide if the opportunity is worth it or not. I'm kind of wrestling with this truth, with this myself. Uh, let, let me give you an example. I have a lot of people, at least once a week, I get a call from somebody who wants me to trademark their company name, okay? I don't usually do trademark filings for my clients. They tend to be very complicated, very icky. I've been referring these people to a local trademark lawyer, actually two trademark lawyers for many years, but every week now I'm starting to get two, three calls like this. So I'm kind of wondering now, how long and how difficult would it be for me to learn enough trademark law that I could do a basic trademark registration? You know, is, it, is, it worth, is the investment of time worth the additional money that I would get by picking up that new skill set? You know, and possibly take on the bigger risk of a malpractice case if I really screw up one of my first few jobs. That's the, that's the trade-off. You know, is, is the money worth it? Is it worth the years of, of training? Be very careful. The world is changing so rapidly. You can spend five years of your life training for something that no one's going to want in five years. Here's my best advice. Do you know how to code software? Okay, seriously. There are schools in New York City. They are called coding academies. They're privately run, and basically all they do is they teach you how to code different types of software. You know, either the Microsoft stuff, the Android stuff, you sign up for different programs, Apple stuff, depending on what you're interested in, and they teach you all the various programming languages, how to do different things, you know, in, in whatever programming language you sign up for. The typical course is six to eight weeks. The typical cost is usually two to $3,000. It's total immersion. You will do nothing else with your life for the six to eight weeks but learn a specific programming language. But let me tell you, their, their placement rate on graduation, 100%. For the hot, you know, the new startups in Silicon Alley in Manhattan, they all get their people from these coding academies. The best advice I can give any young person in high school today is whatever you learn, whatever you major in, whatever, learn how to code software. Mark Andreessen, the guy who founded... Um, uh, Netscape back in the 90s said, in 10 years, everything is going to be software. And the people who will be, who'll be able to survive and grow are the people who know how to run that software and how to make those machines sing. Anybody else is going to be run by those machines. The machine is going to be the boss. Okay? That's a very hard, I mean, that's a very cold message, but I think he's right. 
in a lot of ways. Learn, spend six to eight weeks of your life learning how to code. There's a cartoon in this week's New Yorker, by the way. I always read the cartoons in the New Yorker. It shows this guy who's kind of like he's on a hospital bed, he's on life support, and there's this doctor hovering over him who's obviously giving him bad news. And he says, we're sorry, Mr. So-and-so, but your liver transplant got taken by somebody who knew how to code. <laughs> Funny. But that's the world we're looking into. Listen, the library wants us out of here in 15 minutes. I have some things to do. I got to get all these wires off me. I'll hang around for a few minutes. If you have any specific questions that you don't want the IRS to know about, uh, I'll be more than happy to do that. But otherwise, thank you very much, guys. You've been a great crowd. And you know where to reach me if you have any other questions. All right? Thank you very much.